Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new episode of the Sports Insight with your host Alandar Khan. And yes, as you know, we give you sports information from all across the globe. You guys can surely reach out to us on our social media handle, which is at the rate of Indus News Sports. That basically works both for Twitter and for Instagram. But anyways, we'll go to the headlines first. Pakistan vs Zimbabwe, the second test being played at Harare. And yes, from the world of NBA, Mavericks defeat Brooklyn Nets 113 to 109, while Golden State Warriors win against Thunder 118 to 97. And Manchester United set up Europa League final versus Villarreal on May 26. From the world of tennis, yes, world number one Ashley Barty defeated Paula Barossa on Thursday to reach the Madrid Open final. And yes, those were the headlines. And surely we're still discussing the, the current tour that's happening, Pakistan versus Zimbabwe. Obviously, the second test is surely underway. Pakistan managed to win that first test and it was surely very crucial for Zimbabwe to get there, you know, uh, Pakistan managing to break them at that very point. But we'll surely be discussing all this in information with regards to uh, the world of cricket and this current tour as well. So for that, we have Yas Rana all the way from the UK. Yas, welcome to the show. Pleasure to join you. Great. So Yas, we'll start off with the current test that's underway. We'll surely talk about Pakistan versus Zimbabwe. The s second test is still underway. We talk about the first one. What was your take on the entire test side? And surely after that, we can discuss what really happened in the world of T20 for us. So to begin with, your take on the first test to begin. Uh, well, it's a really comprehensive victory for Pakistan. Um, I think one thing that um, international viewers, people who haven't followed Pakistani domestic cricket um, that closely in the last couple of years, they'll be really pleasantly surprised to see Has Hassan Ali's kind of resurgence as an international cricketer. Um, he obviously burst onto the scene 2016, 2017, was brilliant in the Champions Trophy for Pakistan in 2017, right. um, but kind of lost his way a little bit. Um, and seeing him take the new ball with Shaheen Afridi, taking nine wickets in the match, um, and also the Pakistan now trust him enough to bat its number seven in the ongoing uh, second test match. So that'd be interesting to see. So I think the uh, return to form of Hassan Ali makes Pakistan a much stronger outfit. Um, and also the continued runs of Fahad Alam. Once he gets to 50, he gets to 100. That's the fourth time he's got to 50 in Test cricket. That's the fourth time he's got to 100. That's a that's a world record. No one's ever done that in Test cricket before. Um, and no, you know, if you look through that Pakistan middle order now, Azhar Ali at three, Baba Azam four, Fahad Alam five, um, Mohammad Rizwan at six. That's a really, you know, that's the makings of a really strong middle order. And I know that Azhar Ali and Fahad Alam are. Uh, are getting on a bit. They're in their mid to late thirties, um, but there's no reason they could they can they can hang on for another couple of years yet. So I think a really encouraging performance for Pakistan against Zimbabwe side, um, who, who 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 caused the odd surprise in international cricket. Right, but we talk about tests. Obviously, tests are more stronger. You need to be more into it. You need to obviously there's a lot of energy that that that, that is drained to be precise. But if we talk about Fawad Alam, as you mentioned, if we look back into obviously him making this record. Talk about Fawad Alam, obviously he was missing, you know, he was missing for a very long time, which was surely a bigger loss mm. for Pakistan, if we think about it that way. But what do you see, because it's not only Fawad Alam that we talk about, obviously Hassan Ali is now, as a bowler, I think he's brilliant, he's, he's performed phenomenally well, but this would be the test side. But what about, there are some other players, if you look into stats and you talk about stats, what's your take on Tabish Khan? Uh, I think it's just... I don't know, to be honest. I don't know. I don't watch enough Pakistani first class cricket to really know uh, where Tabish Khan is at. Right. What I would say is that where Pakistan are at as a test side, um, you know, they, they're kind of, um, they are below the top four of Australia, New Zealand, India, right. um, and India at the moment. And they're trying to break into that. And, they, and I think Pakistan cricket needs to be thinking, how can we, how can we emulate a side like New Zealand who've slowly built up, um, they've built a team around a few, a small number of world class players. I mean, they developed over a number of years. And, you know, if, you, if you're trying to get to that level, I struggle to see where a 36-year-old seamer who's not played test cricket before really fits into that. Right. Um, especially in a series against, like, New Zealand, I would be tempted to give, um, I'm not sure exactly who, but but give opportunities to younger players who who, who have more potential um, who could be in that Pakistan side for five to ten years. I think it's a very, very 
short-term um, outlook and one that's probably not required for a series against Zimbabwe, um, especially when you've got Hassan Ali um, and Shaheen Nafridi re- leading that attack. It's a perfect opportunity to bring in someone younger. I think, I think it's a missed opportunity for Pakistan, really. Right. So uh, in terms of this, if we look back into the T20 side, when we talk about this entire situation and this entire scenario, if you look into the T20 side, when Pakistan which was surprised to see, we, everybody was surprised to see Pakistan performing against Zimbabwe in a very slow pitch, in a very slow delivery side. And Pakistan uh, not only get, getting those victories, but it took them a lot of effort to do that. There was a lot of fall of wickets in the middle order, you know, and, and after the middle order, it was an instant collapse. But obviously, you know, there were a few odd top-notch players that would actually, and that's what we do, we mostly rely on them. So when do we come to the point of having a solid T20 team to begin with? Well, wh- you, ma- you made a really good point there in that Pakistan are very reliant on their, that top order of Rizwan, Babar, uh, Fakhazaman, Mohammed Hafiz in T20 cricket. That, that is definitely true. Um, but I'd also say that that is, that is a problem that most teams in, in world cricket face. Um, the easiest place to bat in T20 cricket is at the top of the order. Everyone wants to bat at the top of the order in T20 right. cricket. You get, um, the, you get to face the harder new ball, um, you have the fielding restrictions in the first six overs. If you survive the power play, it's kind of allowed to take your foot off the gas for a couple of overs in the middle before accelerating later. It's right. really hard in T20 cricket to, to hit the ball from ball one. Um, and at the moment, Pakistan are kind of putting in their least experienced players in that middle order. Something that I'd like to see personally um, is is taking a risk and putting one of the more experienced players to bat at five or six. You know, you could count on one hand the number of world class um, numbers five or sixes in T20 cricket. It's really difficult to come in from ball one. You know, Joss Butler's one, Andre Russell's another one, Amy de Villiers is another one. You know, you're talking like the very, very best players in world cricket. Right. Um, and it's not it's not a great shame that Pakistan don't have that at the moment. So I'd be looking at trying to get one of the more experienced players um, some game time lower down the order. It's kind of what England are doing at the moment with Johnny Bairstow. Johnny Bairstow is a brilliant opening batsman in white ball cricket. Um, and England had lots of top order options and they looked at Johnny Best though and they thought he had the game to play lower down in the order and I, and I wonder if one of the Pakistanis, um, may, may, maybe Fakhar Zaman, maybe Rizwan um, could have the game plan to go go low in the order. Because I look at that lineup um, from the T20 series and look at Haider Ali coming at six. Right. That's a very difficult position. You know, he made his name in the PSL batting higher up in the order. That's a very hard job to give a young batsman making his way in the international cricket. Um, I'd like one of the senior batsmen to be given that role, right. um, and Haider Ali, who I think is brilliant. I think he's, I think he's, he could go right to the very top. Um, I'd like to see him kind of make his way in international cricket at the top of the order where he's most comfortable. So you talking about Haider Ali? To be honest, I absolutely adore his performance. But yet again, uh, like you said, that you know, if they come at the middle order or after that, maybe six down. Obviously, he will not be able to get the, that courage to face the ball and, you know, just hit the, the target. Because the point is, we've seen him perform superbly well in terms of PSL. But what do you think that, you know, if these youngsters are put in the test match to begin with and, you know, giving them the time to learn, to practice? Because I think test match I- are more tougher, as discussed earlier, against the T20. So what if they start using them, a senior and a junior, going out there to bat for the test side? Well, I think it's the way cricket is going at the moment, the way um, T20 cricket is, is an increasingly specialised game. Uh, the the, the skill set required to be a brilliant number five or number six in T20 cricket is just so different to anything you need to do in test cricket. Um, I would be hesitant to use test cricket to bed players in with an eye on T20 cricket. The formats are going further and further away from each other. Right. Um, T20 cricket is going further and further away from ODI cricket. You know, five years ago, if you looked at um, the best T20 I'd say teams in the world, it'd be very similar to that country's ODI side, and they're kind of diverging now. Right. Um, so Test cricket, I, I would be I would be hesitant to put in young players in Test cricket with an eye on T20 cricket. I'm more for young players playing Test cricket, but I think it should be for their Red Bull domestic first class record, not their White Bull record. That's an interesting take. But you know, uh, in terms of uh, getting experiences from different individuals who've actually talked about cricket, a lot of people have actually come up with the opinion that, you know, if we bring in a youngster in the test side uh, along with the senior, so there's a more learning phase for them because there's not a lot of pressure. The amount of pressure that you have in the T20s, obviously, you know it, I know it. It's very different. But when it comes to test side, I think in terms of learning, that surely can add a lot of value to the the youngsters. Mm. It's a good point, but I think 
it's on the Pakistani um, uh, camp, the, the, the leadership group in the Pakistan setup, to create an environment where young players don't feel that pressure when they come in. Um, you know, one of the great things about the England side that have been so good for the last five, six years in white ball cricket is that Owen Morgan takes off that pressure. Right. Every player who comes into the squad is 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 made to feel that you, you get more than one opportunity. Play the way that you play in domestic cricket. Play the way that you got the opportunity to play for your country. Right. Um, and you will get the chance. Don't worry about it. Play your natural way. If you're an aggressive batsman, you will fail more times than you succeed. That's how T20 cricket works. Um, and, it's de- and, and one thing I think Pakistan could really benefit from is kind of you know, releasing that pressure away from young players. So when, when a young player comes into the team, right. they know I'm going to get six to seven games here. I can bat the way I should bat. Because in T20 cricket, you, the worst thing for a batting lineup is players worrying about their spots in the side. Because if right. you worry about your spot in the side, then you kind of bat within yourself and then you don't bat with, this, with, the, with the correct intent that the team needs. So um, it's, I think it's all about creating an environment in which players can, can succeed. Um, and I'm not sure Pakistan have that at the moment. I, I, just, I really don't like Hedda Rally batting as low as he has been batting. I a player absolutely. like that should be playing. I absolutely exactly understand the because same. that's not the way he bats, to be, to be very honest. And, you know, I think Hedder Lee has a lot of potential to do more. We're surely looking forward for the T20 World Cup. Let's hope for the best in the future that, you know, we have that gel team that manages to do so. Yes, thank you so very much for being a part of the show and discussing the world of cricket with us. Awesome. I really enjoyed that. Great. So yes, that was Rana and he surely talked about the same situation and scenarios with regards to Pakistan cricket and I think there were some valid points to discuss and obviously talking about letting these youngsters perform as they should and you know they should not be having that number of pressure or coming down at six down it would be very pressurizing for them. But anyways, we'll take a quick break and once we're back from the break we'll surely talk about more sports to you guys after the break. Welcome back from the break. And yes, before the break, we were discussing Pakistan versus Zimbabwe situation. But yes, as we discuss all sorts of sports, we'll surely be talking about the world of NBA. Not to forget that we also discussed how Mavericks defeated Brooklyn Nets, which is another sad story in terms of the whole situation. But anyways, to discuss more to in the world of NBA, we have with us Matthew Miranda. Matthew, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you today? So far, so good. Anyways, we'll surely be talking about the major upset in terms of uh, the upsets that have been happening lately. We'll talk about the first match, which is the Mavericks defeating Brooklyn Nets 113 to 109. What's your take on this match specifically to begin with? Um, it's another. Dallas has been playing pretty well, especially behind Luka Doncic of late. It is an upset for Brooklyn. Brooklyn has not been able to get healthy all year. They were missing James Harden again in this game, and although. Kyrie Irving was amazing and had 45 points. Um, Kevin Durant was very quiet, didn't really shoot well. And um, it kind of raises the question people have had with Brooklyn all year, which is Brooklyn is incredibly talented, but can they get their best players all healthy at the same time? So far, the answer has been no. Right. And to be honest, a lot of fans have been upset. <clears throat> We've been seeing of trending tweeting with regards to that obviously people are upset and not to forget if you look back into a few matches uh, there have been a constant defeat against the Bucks to begin with so I think they're surely slowly and gradually going down uh, so what exactly can they do to maintain uh, their ranking now Brooklyn seems to have decided that they do not care about the regular season they right. just want everyone healthy for the playoffs so they lost the two games, like you said, to the Bucks, which might hurt them because now Milwaukee can pass them for the two seed, which would drop Brooklyn to three and make their job much harder. But they seem to be gambling that as long as everyone's healthy, we not, we're not worried about where we play or who we play, we'll be fine. It's a gamble. Usually teams have to have some time together right. to gel and come together. And Brooklyn has decided we're, that they're so talented that that doesn't matter as much as just being healthy. So. It's a gamble, and we'll see what happens once the playoffs roll around. But you're right, they are slipping. Um, they should have been number one, and now they're going to drop probably to number three. Right. But if it, even if we talk about gelling, I think in terms of team, in terms of there's one thing called the star power. I understand they still have that star power, and they want to gamble on this level. But what if, as you mentioned, the gelling part, what if that doesn't happen, the trio doesn't work? That would be a big question mark for them. It would, and I... I I, I think that they're taking a major risk. I think to some extent they don't have a choice. Um, 
James Harden pulled a hamstring. Hamstrings are notoriously difficult to recover from. He was getting better. Then he had a setback and injury. I think on some level, they probably wanted to take the regular season a little more seriously than they have. But I feel that they don't. They just don't see the incentive in 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 and or they don't see the opportunity to gel. So they're going to just push all their chips into let's be healthy. I agree with you. I think it's a risk. Um, but they've. You know, Durant is playing his first season after a major foot injury. Harden has struggled. Kyrie's been in and out. They just kind of have to roll with that and, and, and see what they can make of it. But I do think it's a major gamble. And if they lose, someone's going to get blamed. And it's, it's I don't know who it's going to be, but it's going to be someone. Because if you look back into how James Harden actually wanted, you know, a, a, a trio team, to be precise. Let's take it that way. We have not really seen the trio perform. We've always seen the duos performing because there have been only seven matches and I think <coughs> one of them <coughs> was injured. And once again, it was a duo performing. But this time, it's a different duo. It's missing James Harden. So the point is, K, where did they go wrong? And if they seriously think at the playoffs, they'll have like three, the trio that they really want to, want to work, it's going to be very doubtful for them. I think they have a little less anxiety than usual because Harden and Durant, it was a while ago, but they did play together years ago as teammates. Right. And Harden is such a gifted um, passer. I mean, everyone knows him for his scoring, but he's such a gifted passer that I think it's easier to work in a player like that than just someone who wants to score. Um, so they're gambling that. And all this time, remember, I mean, Harden is out injured, but he also has all this time to sit on the bench, watch the team, study them, learn. He's a very smart player. I think it will fit better than most. I don't think it will hurt them in the first round of the playoffs, but I think when they have to play now Milwaukee and Philadelphia, those teams have confidence against Brooklyn because they've both beaten them most of the time this year. And I think that's where Brooklyn lost an edge psychologically. Absolutely. And I think you're absolutely right in terms of this. And not to forget that this is not the only thing that would surely let them down in terms of not gelling in in the future would surely be a problem. But anyways, let's hope things sort out for them. We'll surely have a word about uh, the next uh, match that we'd like to discuss, which was the, the Golden State Warriors winning against Thunder 118 to 97. And obviously, Steph Curry scoring a uh, high 34 point against the Thunder. So what's your take on that match? Um, it's Oklahoma City's one of the worst teams in the league right now. They're not even trying. It's actually a source of some controversy. They're just content to lose as badly as they can to win um, a better shot at a, at a high draft pick. Golden State's doing what they have to do. They're beating on bad teams. I, I don't know what to make of them because it still seems like it's mostly Steph Curry um, and everyone else is, is, is following his lead. And I, they're in a position where it looks now like the Lakers could drop to the seventh seed. And if they do, there's a good chance the Lakers will play Golden State in a one game um, playing tournament, which would be tremendously exciting. Right. And I think Golden State is more dangerous in that in the playoffs than they are now. I don't think Golden State is a team because of Steph Curry, like you said, nobody wants to play them, even though they don't really have a great record yet. Right. Um, Golden State, they're, they're doing what they have to do. Steph is awesome and they're beating bad teams and they're, they're going to be a team nobody wants to play. Right. It would be interesting to see, as you mentioned, obviously the Lakers versus Warriors. That, if that happens, that surely would be an interesting game. But uh, as we mentioned, star power aside, it's all about the gelling in part anyways. It is. And the Lakers are in that, in that problematic situation. Also, Anthony Davis last night, their great center, um, had to leave the game early with back spasms. He has not been able to come back and establish himself as healthy. LeBron James has been in and out of the lineup. The Lakers, I think, are a little different case than the Nets because a lot of them were together a year ago and they did win a title. And LeBron is usually so good that he can he can cover up a lot of problems. But you're right. I think uh, I think there's a really um, interesting divide this year between teams that have focused on preparing for the playoffs and teams that are just trying to get there. And it'll be interesting to see teams like the Lakers and the Nets are they talented enough to just win? I think they will early. But I think the Lakers, like the Nets, may struggle when they get to some of the better teams that have had all year to really work together. Yeah, talking about those teams who have actually worked all year, we can look at Bucks, for instance. Look at them gelling in, using their entire coordination, their confidence, and slowly and gradually getting up there. So I think it's going to be uh, a star power thing and a coordinated, gelled team to have a you know tournament together. Mm -hmm. And the Bucks, interesting, have been 
similar but different to the Nets in a certain sense. The Bucks have used the regular season to test their defense, to try out a lot of different things. But the Bucks you see now at the end are really playing their best ball heading into the playoffs, which in the past they've been great all season, but always kind of at like a steady level and they don't go up. And this right. is the first year that I've seen Milwaukee do that. Um, I think you're right. I think I think the Bucks are probably a, the most dangerous team for Brooklyn, certainly to face. And I think I think the Bucks could easily get to the finals and could beat anyone they play. Not only, like you said, they have tremendous star power. They have Giannis Antetokounmpo, they have Drew Holiday, they have Chris Middleton, but also they've had a lot of time to to come together as a team. Right. So they're kind of the best of both worlds. They have star power, but they also work together as a unit. Right. So let's see how things go by for them. I would like to talk about the next match, which is obviously the Washington Wiz Wizards, the victory against the Raptors, which was 131 to 129. Obviously a close call and Bradley Beal scored like 28 points against the Raptors. So what's your take on this match? It was a big game. Toronto, it was Toronto's last chance really to make the playoffs. They had to beat Washington to try to get in. And unfortunately, Toronto's had, especially with COVID, one of the more difficult years in the league. They've had to play outside of Canada. Right. Um, they haven't had their fans around. So it was sad for them, I think, because they're a better team than their record has shown. Washington, if you can figure them out, I'll pay you a million dollars because I can't figure them out. They have been crazy up and down. Now for the last few weeks, nobody can beat them. Uh, they have be, they're have kind of like Golden State in that. I think they're a more dangerous team come the playoffs because with Bradley Beal and Russell Westbrook, every single night, they have the chance to beat anybody. The thing with Washington is they also play poorly enough that they have the chance to lose to anybody but they've been on an incredible run now for weeks interesting so how what's your take in in generally if we talk about the conferences uh, if we look at the eastern conference obviously we still have the 76ers uh, nets and the bucks on the top three and on the, on the western side if you look back it's jazz suns clippers and fourth is nuggets so what's your entire perspective with regards to where do you see these standings going i think um I think the standings will hold in the East. I think Philadelphia will finish first. I think Milwaukee will pass Brooklyn. Um, and I think as far as the West goes, the race at the top has been tied all year between Utah and Phoenix. I think Utah will hold on. I think that the Clippers and Denver will come down to the last game, probably for the three seed. What's interesting in the West is because the Lakers are falling so much, you're going to have this kind of ironic dance at the end where usually teams want to fight for the best position. But this year, because the Lakers keep dropping, teams like Utah and Phoenix do not want to finish one or two and have the reward for it be the Lakers in the first round. So there's this odd anxiety in the West where the best teams have done great all year and their reward for it might be the Lakers, which nobody wants. Would make for great entertainment, but it's sad for those teams that they've played that well and they're still gonna get the defending champs in the first round. Right, right. Thank you so very much, Matthew, for being a part of the show and discussing the in-depth analysis in the world of NBA. Thank you very much. Yeah, always happy to be here. Thank you. Great. So, yes, he definitely talked about all the situation scenarios, starting from the first match, which we talked about, obviously, the Brooklyn Nets losing against the Mavericks, and not to forget that they have also lost against Bucks in the, in the past week, and surely they're missing James Harden a lot, but let's see how things flow by for them in the future, and, you know, there will be more interesting playoffs coming in soon, so I think all of these teams are actually strategizing themselves to place themselves where they can actually make the most of uh, the NBA. But anyways, this was the NBA side. I'll quickly jump over to the world of football and update you guys more. more. Manchester United reached Europa League final despite losing against Roma. And yes, not to forget that this was an aggregated score that actually clinched them that 8-5 victory against Roma. And United has actually <coughs> won the European uh, Euro Europa League final back in 2017. And not to forget that, you know, it has surely been an interesting journey. Villarreal is the, the next team that they will be facing and that it would be an interesting thing because they actually defeated Arsenal 2-1. So Arsenal has not been at the very prime and the very best. But to be honest, if you look into situation scenarios, I think Manchester United is surely on the interesting side of the situation. And if you talk about Cavani, he has been brilliant in terms of scoring and I think Cavani actually managed to score the second leg and this, he managed to score 13 goals. So <coughs> A big round of applause for him. <clears throat> I think in the long run, it surely would be more interesting. But let's see how this entire perspective when it comes to the final 
ends up. Anyways, this was from the world of football. I'll quickly jump over to the world of tennis. Yes, talking about tennis, Ashley Barty actually, actually cruised into the Madrid Open Finals after defeating Paula. And Paula Badosa obviously had to lose in the situation 6-4, 6-3. So it has been an interesting journey for Ashley Barty. To forget, not to forget that, you know, now every, everything is pretty much streamlined in terms of the Madrid Open. And she has actually lost once. If you look back into 6-4, 6-3, she had lost against Badosa. But anyways... You know, in terms of sports, this is how it really works. But now, it's surely going to be an interesting journey for her. And, you know, not to forget that, you know, 2019 French Open was, is, is the fourth title of the year. And Barty will play against Salabanca in Madrid uh, for the finals. But anyways, this was pretty much it in terms of sports. If you guys want to reach out to us, you can on social media handle, which is at the rate of Indus News Sports. Till then, take good care of yourselves and bye-bye.